the biggest reasons a producer might want to consider ammoniating something like wheat straw would just be in response to drought conditions, uh, something where we're experiencing a severe shortage of forages or at least harvested forages that they might be able to feed through the winter months. Um, and so there's, you know, there's some opportunity to be, to be had there if we, if we can't source uh, something like a comparable grass hay or, or some other cane forages due to drought. And so ammoniated wheat straw fits very nicely into to some of these winter feeding programs for the cow herd. There's actually several benefits to ammoniating low quality forages. One, we, we typically increase the nitrogen content of the forage. Uh, we do add a little bit of non-protein nitrogen to the forage. In addition to that, we also see an improvement in dry matter digestibility of the forage, which then leads to an increase in intake. And, and really that's the biggest driver when we look at low quality forage consumption uh, to a cow is can we get her to eat as, as much as we'd like her to to, to meet uh, her nutrient demands. The best forages to utilize with ammoniation are going to be low quality forages. So uh, definitely under 5% crude protein. We're also looking for something that's uh, relatively low in TDN content. Uh, I would say a cutoff there would be something in the range of 45 and 50 or less. One of the things we don't want to do is, is look at ammoniating anything that's a high quality forage. So anything that would be above that 5% guideline or that 50% TDN would not be a good candidate uh, for ammoniation. Primarily because if we ammoniate a higher quality forage, we can uh, produce some toxic compounds that can, can lead to some real problems. The best advice I can give you is if you have some hay that you think might be a good candidate, uh, take some bale cores, 20% of those bales, sample those, send them into a lab, get an analysis on it, and, and definitely know what you're going to ammoniate because there, there are some risks involved. Well, the, the basic um, um, steps would be to, to start off with would be to do some site prep. You're ideally looking for a flat site. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is any site where we we ammoniate roughages, uh, we're going to essentially sterilize the ground. So there's there's if it's cropland, we want to be sensitive to that. Uh, what we would recommend is doing a light tillage of the soil, maybe coming in and removing some of that soil, making an, a berm so that there's a nice flat area to, to make your stack on. Then you want to start by stacking the bales. Uh, it's ideal ideal to, to leave about two to three inches between each bale so that we've got some air circulating uh, uh, through the stack to, to help with the ammoniation process. Then once the hay is stacked, you can either do a three, two, uh, one stack or a three, two stack. It really depends on the size of the bales you're working with and the width of the plastic that you're able to procure. Uh, probably the most common size of plastic is going to be 40 by 100. Uh, it's a six mil. Black plastic is what we typically use. Uh, and then we'll will actually you can insert your ammoniation hose. You could uh, actually do the insertion points. Uh, it's very common to use one insertion point. You can do multiple sites. Um, however, it, it may or may not be a factor. Um, you know, generally the concept is you know two is better than one, three might be better than two, but it's not an absolute necessity to, to do that. The, the general concept is just to simply get the anhydrous into the stack. Uh, what a lot of people will use is just an anhydrous hose with an open end with a valve and they'll essentially stand that up into the stack so it's propped up not laying on the ground. The, the process that I like the best is actually unrolling that plastic on one side of the bales. Pull your plastic up over the top and then begin sealing the edges with dirt. Uh, ideally you want to work from one side of the stack to the other so that you're drawing the plastic a little bit tighter as you work down and, and seal the edges with soil. Uh, we'd probably like to have maybe uh, at least three foot is what I'm comfortable with as far as plastic around the edges that we're going to put uh, dirt on. Uh, and then I'm going to say uh, at least about a foot of you know nice damp soil to seal the edges of that plastic. Have the the hose connected to the tank, uh, then you'll turn that hose on. And our, our target application rate historically has been a 3% application of anhydrous ammonia on a dry matter basis of, of whatever the weight of the stack is. Uh, so it's essentially 60 pounds per ton. Uh, we have been doing some work at some lower rates, uh, looking at a 1.5% application rate and, and seeing how that responds. Uh, in general, if, you're, if you've got an application rate between 1.5 to 3% on a dry matter basis, uh, you should get effective ammoniation. There's a tremendous number of safety concerns with anhydrous ammonia. I think anyone involved in farming operations is aware of the danger involved with that. Uh, it's very caustic to the, to the skin, can damage the eyes. It's even recommended that if you have contact
contact lenses that you remove those. Anhydrous ammonia is a liquid seeking substance. So that's why it is so important for farmers to use personal protection equipment whenever they're working around anhydrous. The primary chores that we do on the farm, tasks that we do with anhydrous are opening valves and connecting hoses on the tank. The first and most important part of our body that we want to protect is our eyes and you want to wear ventless goggles that look just like this or a full face shield or if you wanted to go the extra length you could get a, a respirator with a cartridge that's uh, made for ammonia but but just for for farm purposes ventless goggles um, will will add that protection and keep the vapor from seeping under the, the goggles into the eyes next we need to always wear um, heavy-duty rubber gloves um, these would the longer the length of the glove, the better. You'd like them to go to your elbow. These are rubber gloves that have a little bit of a cloth lining so they are comfortable. Long sleeves, long pants, and solid shoes. You want to protect as much of the skin surface as possible so the vapor has very little opportunity to attack the, the body and um, if there is an accidental release. Water is really the only first aid for anhydrous ammonia. So every anhydrous ammonia tank that you get from your supplier will have a tank of water on it. In addition to that tank of water, the, the, the producer who is, is uh, co connecting and disconnecting the valves should also keep a bottle of water in their pocket. And in addition, you'd like to have at least a five gallon container of water somewhere on the premises very close to get to uh, in case of an accidental uh, spill or exposure. Again, the eyes are probably the most likely to be affected. Um, anhydrous, because it's a vapor, also is it, may, it causes an inhalation problem. But flushing the eyes with water, so that bottle of water in your pocket is very important because that's going to be some immediate first aid. Uh, a couple of different approaches to, to getting the amount of an anhydrous that you need. Probably the best way is to work with your local cooperative figure out the exact or approximate amount of anhydrous ammonia you need and pre-order the tank with that amount of anhydrous uh, in it. Another way to do that is uh, to actually get a, a tank that's going to have um, oh, a, a relatively known amount of, of anhydrous in it. You can then calculate based on the percentage in the tank actually how many pounds of anhydrous are in that tank and then uh, apply based on the gauge. Uh, I much prefer the first method in terms of ordering the exact amount so that we actually don't have any more anhydrous on hand, but uh, in visiting with some producers that's that's getting tough to do with some of the co-ops to get those pre-order those tanks with that exact, exact amount of anhydrous in them. In warmer temperatures we can actually, if it's above 80 degrees, it only takes uh, 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 two weeks to, to fully treat a stack. Uh, if we're well over 100 degrees, uh, maybe a week. Uh, so there is an influence in temperature. As we get colder, it's going to have to stay in the stack longer, uh, which that presents a challenge because here in Kansas, especially western Kansas, keeping the plastic on the stack is probably our biggest challenge. Uh, one of the things you can do to help with that is to, to orient your stack with the prevailing winds uh, so that those winds are not you know, coming up against the stack but coming alongside it uh, but just generally uh, you want to get it done when the temperatures are warmer as opposed to cooler because it's just simply going to take longer and there's there's less uh, risk of having a tear or rip in the plastic. Usually the next step I would recommend is uh, you want to uncover it let that hay breathe for maybe a couple three days. I would also like to come back in and maybe take some forage samples to test it to see exactly what we've uh, what we've accomplished there know what our nutrient content is so we can calculate our our rations appropriately and figure our supplement into it. Once you have your, your forage uh, samples, any commercial uh, forage testing laboratory should be able to run those analyses for you. In some cases, after we get those results back, the, the really the first step is take a look at those, uh, see what you've got in, in terms of the protein levels, energy content, etc. Uh, then one of the best things I would recommend to, to folks here in Kansas is all of our agents, county agents in the state of Kansas, have a ration balancing software. 
And, and so the best thing to do is to take those results along with some knowledge about their cows, stage of production, et cetera, sit down with your local county extension professional, and, and they will be able to, to help you run those rations and actually look at what the exact amounts of supplements you would need, how much feed you would need to deliver, and what the appropriate amount would, would be. The good thing about ammoniation is it, it's very simple. The, the technology is simple, the, the chemistry is relatively simple. Uh, ammoniating uh, roughages and low quality forages is, is not new technology. This has you know, been explored since the 70s. There's a lot of different uh, uh, agents that were involved. Anhydrous ammonia is just the one that's most readily available to most folks in, in the farming community and, and ranching community. So it, the technology does work. It produces a, a high quality, very palatable forage. Uh, the other advantages to ammoniation is the fact that it can these bales can be handled and, and fed with most of the traditional equi equipment. Uh, they can be fed in bale rings. Uh, cattle consume it really well. Uh, it can be rolled out on pasture with bale beds. Uh, all the conventional equipment, it's, it's not something that has to be ground and processed and, and certainly the, the chemistry does work uh, to improve the forage. Uh, it certainly works.